You're watching Harsh Rules. This is Ben Harsh, and today let's learn to play Castle Risk. Parker Brothers produced the first edition of Castle Risk in 1986. This version has a small 19 by 19 inch board that folds in half. I'm not really fond of this board. Everything feels really squashed down and cramped. The Ottoman Empire in particular really suffers here. Turkey and the Black Sea almost fall off the edge of the board, which doesn't really help because there are special rules for the Black Sea. For playing pieces, Castle Risk uses mini triangles and stars. I'm guessing Parker Brothers miniaturized them to accommodate the smaller board. But one neat approach is that the star pieces are a shade lighter than the triangles, which makes them stand out. The plastic admiral ship and the turreted castle with the removable banners are very cool. Every time you defeat another castle, you can plug in their banner as a kind of war trophy. Um, the deck of cards are on the small side for me, but they are plastic coated with rounded corners. Now let's take a look at the second 1990 edition. This version, what I like to call the last chance edition, is sold as a bonus combo with regular risk. The castle wrist board is printed on the flip side of the regular wrist board. Since this board is 19 by 29 inches and folds three ways, Parker Brothers redrew the castle wrist map. This solves all the complaints I had with the original board. Unfortunately, Parker Brothers cut costs everywhere else. The plastic admiral ship and the turreted castle with the cool banners are gone. Instead, you get these cheap cardboard tokens to stand in for the castles. The cards are downgraded to cheap paper. The stars and triangles are shared with regular wrists, so they're the usual size and they don't have any special shading. If you really enjoyed Castle Risk, I'd go for the best of both worlds and combine them. Get the bigger 1990 board and play with the nicer 1986 pieces. If I had to choose one over the other, I'd pick the 1986 version for the better game pieces and just suffer with the smaller board. Okay, let's walk through the setup phase. Castle Risk can be played with up to six players. The first step is to choose an empire. So everyone will roll a six-sided die. The player with the highest number chooses first and so on in that order. Choosing an empire and location for your castle is a critical strategy. If your castle falls, then the game is over for you. So let's first look at the empires carefully to see their advantages and disadvantages. So first things first, let me show you the countries you can't choose. You can't choose the bright green countries. These are independent nations composed of 11 territories. If you hold all 11 territories, you earn six bonus armies during the spoils phase. That's the background on the independent nations. Now let's look at the countries you can choose. Most players favor the French Empire, and here's the reasons. Six total territories where you can place your castle. Remember, holding all six territories gives you four bonus armies during the spoils phase. One territory, Paris, is totally landlocked, so there's no naval access to it. Five territories have international harbors. They're bordered by an ocean or sea. Sea borders are important because you can conduct a naval landing with the Admiral's ship on another territory or potentially be invaded by a foreign naval landing, so pay attention to the shores of your country. Two territories, Brittany and Burgundy, have sea lanes to the British Empire. Dotted sea lanes mean you do not need the Admiral's ship to cross the sea. Two out of three of your neighbors are independent countries. If you hold all three independent nations, you earn four bonus armies during the spoils phase. And your two empire neighbors are Britain and Germany. So you can see the French Empire has a lot of advantages. Now let's look at the British Empire. The British Empire is also highly sought after by players. Five total territories to place your castle. All empires are either five or six territories. The British Empire has one less territory to hold to earn the four army bonus during the spoils phase. All five territories have international harbors. It is an island country after all. Two sea lanes from London connect to the French Empire, Britain's only formal empire neighbor, so it's pretty isolated. One sea lane connects to an independent country via Norway, so you have access to that. And two sea lanes connect Ireland to Scotland and Wales, so the British Empire doesn't need the Admiral ship to reach its own territories. The British Empire is another solid choice. Let's look at the German Empire. Five territories to place a castle, with less territories to earn that four army empire bonus. 
three international harbors, two landlocked territories in Bavaria and Saxony, two independent neighbors, and three empire neighbors. Germany is a tougher empire to play because it's surrounded by so many other empires. Let's look at the Austrian Empire now. Five territories to place a castle, only one international harbor, so it's pretty much navy challenged, four landlocked territories, one independent neighbor, and three empire neighbors. Most of Austria is landlocked, surrounded by potential enemies, and with only one international harbor, if you're looking for a challenge, then play this empire. The Ottoman Empire. Six territories, three international harbors in Montenegro, Greece, and Turkey, one landlocked territory in Serbia, and three Black Sea harbors, Turkey, Bulgaria, and Romania. Okay, let's cover the Black Sea quirkiness. The rule is the Black Sea is a landlocked body of water. You cannot launch a naval landing from the Black Sea in Bulgaria and magically appear in the English Channel. What happens in the Black Sea stays in the Black Sea. Finally, we have the Russian Empire. Six territories to place a castle, three landlocked countries in Poland, Smolensk, and Moscow, two international harbors in Livonia and St. Petersburg, one Black Sea harbor in Ukraine, one independent neighbor, and three empire neighbors in Germany, Austria, and the Ottoman. The Russian Empire has a corner advantage, so it's not completely surrounded, but it is a little boxed in. Once you've chosen your empire, it's time to assign territories. Castle Risk uses an American style risk setup to assign territories. American style risk is diplomacy heavy, so be prepared. Choosing territories will no doubt spark friction between players as deals and alliances are made throughout the process. That's American style risk. So following the empire selection of order of play, each player places an army on the board to choose their territories until none remain. All territories must be claimed. This includes the independent territories and don't forget unclaimed territories in other players' empires. The starting territories table shows the number of territories you will get and the armies you will place during the phase. Based on the number of players in your game, leaders in the order of play have a greater chance that they will get an extra territory and army. While the rules state this shouldn't greatly impact the outcome of the game, I say every little bit helps, so roll high. Step 3. It's time to deploy the rest of your armies. All territories are now claimed. Tensions are running high. It's time to push things to the boiling point. The deployable armies table shows how many armies you need to place based on the number of players in your game. This is similar to the last phase, except this time you place five armies in your territories each turn. You can divvy up the five any way you want amongst your territories. Continue this process until all players have depleted their allotment of armies. But be judicious about placement along empire borders and strategic coastlines. Other players may interpret these as acts of aggression. Step four, placing the hidden army. Placing the hidden army. This is one of my favorite mechanics in Castle Risk. Each player gets a post-it note or a scrap of paper and they write down a territory name for their hiding spot. The hidden army can be in your territory or another player's territory. Keep the post-it note, aka the hidden army contract, secret from the other players. The key to remember is that the hidden army can only be brought out when you control that territory. So while soldiers in the regular army are fighting and dying, the hidden army is lying low at some tavern in enemy territory drinking and winching until they receive the signal. For every reinforcement card played, the drunken army, I mean the hidden army, becomes stronger. Because apparently in the world of castle risk, strong ale and spicy tarts make you stronger. When you own the territory and decide to bring them into battle, their army number is based on the total number of army reinforcement cards played at that point. Throughout the game, you can check their strength by looking at the numbers on the playing board and how many cards have been played. Step 5. Dealing the Opening Hand For this phase, shuffle the deck of Castle Risk cards thoroughly and deal three cards to each player. Players should keep their cards secret. There are six kind of cards which I've organized into two groups. Three card types can be played during the Diplomacy phase, and three card types can be played during an Attack phase. 
A little later, I'll discuss the uses for each card in the player round overview. In step six, determining the final order of play. The final step gives the order of play one last good stir. So each player rolls the dice to determine who player one will be, and then you play proceeding left from player one, so basically clockwise around the table until you're back to player one. Now that we're set up, we're gonna look at the phases of a player turn. Phase one is the diplomacy phase. In this phase, you're going to make sure you have at least three cards. So bring your hand up to at least three cards and then draw an additional card from the stack. Then it's time to play some cards. Three of the six card types can be played during this phase, so let's take a look at them. Every time a reinforcement card is played, it stacks at the bottom of the board. And the number of armies you get is outlined in the little circles. So as you put a card down, it starts with three for the first card, four for the second card, and so on. The second type of card that can be played is the Diplomat. When used against another player, that player cannot attack you for an entire round of play. The third type of card that you can play during this phase is the Spy card. The Spy card allows you to look at another player's hand, and then you can assassinate one of their cards. However, when you play the spy card, if the other player has a spy card, they can block your play. What happens then is a counter assassination, although the other spy dies in the line of duty. Once that phase is over, we move on to phase two, which is the attack phase. The attack phase is similar to classic risk in that you can declare an attack from one adjacent territory to another. But however, in castle risk, there are cards that enhance the gameplay. If you play the general or the marshal card, you can add one to your highest dice roll. The admiral allows you to attack by C. Let's run through some scenarios to see how these cards work. First of all, though, let's have a quick refresher on basic risk combat with an infantry versus infantry scenario. Okay, so first of all, you're going to form columns of two as a defender, and then you're going to form columns of three as the attacker. Roll a dice for each unit in the front line. Pair the highest dice rolls with defender to determine who the winner is. Then you just need to remove the defeated units and replace the fallen comrades. Let's look at the same scenario now with general and martial cards in play. Okay, so the general and martial cards, when they're in play, basically enhance your highest dice roll. So you play your cards, then you go through the usual forming your columns of two, you form your columns of three, you roll a dice for each unit in the front line, but the two highest dice will get addition of one. So when you pair them, they will be plus one. In this scenario, it's a tie, so defending always wins the tie. If the marshal or general loses the high dice roll, then they die. Now we're going to modify the scenario to demonstrate a naval landing with an admiral's card in play. The admiral's card essentially facilitates a naval landing. So you would play it like any other scenario, except you're able to actually attack from the sea and attempt to land on a territory. The only way, of course, you can land on the territory is to win the battle. Quick note, the Admiral's card can be reused for other naval landings unless the armies on the ship are killed in the battle. In that case, the ship sinks and the Admiral is killed. The only other way to kill an Admiral is for a spy to assassinate him during the diplomacy phase. Castle sieges, this is what the whole game is about. 
So here we've modified the scenario to show you what it looks like when a castle comes into play. So here we have an, the same attack from London to Burgundy with a castle in play. The great thing about castles is they're a fortification. So the way castle risk recognizes this is it only allows the attacker to attack with two dice um, versus the two dice on the castle side. So this really levels the playing field when a castle is in play. It goes without saying that you can mix and match the cards in the scenario. So you can have a naval laying against a castle, you can have the castle refortify with a marshal, the army can have a general attacking the castle, and all these things are calculated out. Finally, let's look at a scenario where the castle falls. There's huge repercussions for this. When an empire falls, you remove the castle from the board and put the banner in the victor's castle. As a victor, you also get to claim all the fallen empire's cards and their hidden army contract if it's still unused at this point. You remove all the fallen empire armies from the board and then occupation begins. You need to occupy all the vacant territories, first starting with the army involved in the battle. Place one army on each empty territory until you've run out of pieces. Next, you use armies from your neighboring territories. And But once you've run out of armies or you decide you don't want to take the territory, which is also an option, then it goes up to the other players and one, of a, one at a time they place an army until all of the Fallen Empire spaces are full. Phase three, the spoils phase. Essentially in the spoils phase, you get to replenish all your armies. So first though, you need to calculate how many bonus armies you get. You get four bonus armies for each empire that is fully occupied, including your own. You get six bonus armies if you hold all the 11 independents, and you get eight for each banner in your castle, and that includes your own. Also a quick reminder during this phase, you cannot redeploy your existing armies and castle risk. The armies can't be moved unless they're attacking. This is one of the controversial differences between regular risk and castle risk. Castle risk holds a notorious reputation amongst board gamers. Many risk fans call it an abomination. Nearly 30 years after the 1957 debut of Risk in France, Parker Brothers released this full-fledged spin-off of the Venerable series with Castle Risk. To be honest, Castle Risk is like George Lazenby to Risk's Sean Connery. There's nothing really wrong with George Lazenby as the second James Bond, and eventually we'd get Roger Moore, Timothy Dalton, Pierce Brosnan, and Daniel Craig. Or, in other words, Risk Legacy, Risk Godstorm, Risk 2210 AD, and a ton of other fun iterations. But somebody had to be second, and as all fans know, but hate to admit, change is hard. And, is so often the case, Castle Risk was not considered critically or financially successful for Parker Brothers. Castle Risk is not just risk on a map of Europe. Castle Risk demands experience. It is not your gateway game. Castle Risk has a steep learning curve, and many times it's more like a dead man's curve. Everything in Castle Risk is upside down and backwards from what you know about Risk. All the strategy and tactics you've mastered from previous Risk conquests and defeats get chucked right out the window. Players draft new armies at the end of the turn rather than the beginning. Once an army is placed, it cannot be redeployed. Rather than build large bonus armies and launch blitzes, cards are used to augment attacks and harass other players with assassinations and forced diplomacy. Naval landings along coastlines can seemingly come from nowhere. The only core element that remains from risk is the dice pairing combat system. Even that can be augmented with cards played during an attack. Castle Risk is very different. You might not like Castle Risk any better than you did before, but I hope you'll learn to appreciate some of the game's innovative ideas for the time. This has been Harsh for Harsh Rules, and I hope you've enjoyed this tutorial. See you next time.